I've been asked to introduce our second panel this morning, Ethics in the Executive Branch. Uh, before I do, though, I've actually been asked to make an announcement, possibly mildly ethically related. Uh, there's a black Lexus uh, in the parking lot. I think the license plate is GFH2546. And uh, we were informed that the passenger windows open and there are what appears to be legal papers in the front seats. <laughs> Uh, so to the extent that we're preserving client confidences, uh, we've been encouraged that to whomever the car belongs, they might want to look into that, uh, which is a nice segue into ethics in the executive branch. Uh, but, oh, thank you. Uh, which we're honored to have moderated this morning by Judge Jennifer Walker Elrod of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, after her graduation from Harvard Law School, uh, Judge Elrod thankfully came to Houston as soon as possible to clerk for Judge Sim Lake of the Southern District of Texas. After years of private practice, she was first appointed and then twice elected to the 190th District Court where she presided over more than 200 jury trials. Uh, in 2007, she was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit where she has served since. Now, not only does Judge Elrod contribute to the legal community and the practice of law through her legal writing and analysis as a judge, but she also contributes her singing and performing abilities. Uh, as an active member of the Garland Walker Inn of Court, uh, she has in full costume, uh, uh, it, one sentence, presented uh, presentations including the Magna Carta featuring time travel, a presentation last year entitled Star Laws featuring Judge Elrod as Princess Leia, <laughs> and an upcoming presentation this year on piracy. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Judge. Well, Mr. Peterson, Peterson, I'll have to get you back. That was not the lame rank serial number material that you had been given. Um, <laughs> What a great treat and honor it is to be here today at a Texas conference of the Federalist Society where we can talk about such interesting issues that are important public policy matters. And we talk about the rule of law as, as it, as it um, Im is implicated in these public policy issues. We talk about our history. We talk about our Constitution. And we have interesting, diverse speakers. This has been the case since I joined the Tr Federalist Society when I was a law student um, over 25 years ago. So what a neat thing, and that you've spent your Saturday because you care about the rule of law. And guess what? The topic that we have today is ethics in the executive branch. And unlike these other topics that you've had, these controversial or non-controversial <laughs> topics, this is not supposed to be a controversial topic. The greater the power of the executive, the greater the imperative to adhere to the highest ethical standards and the execution of the executive's duties. This has wide support. In fact, I bet you there's nobody in this room who would disagree with that, unlike these other topics that they have. But as we heard from Andre, sometimes the devil is in the details. Um, the extent to which the president is bound by ethics laws, the role of the White House counsel in ensuring adherence to ethics standards in the executive branch, and the ethics involved in the selection of a Supreme Court nominee, and the role of the executive branch in the confirmation process are all fraught with ethical peril if it's not studied and paid attention to. Plus, by sitting in on today's presentation, you will get ethics credit in the Texas Bar if you are a member of the Texas Bar. So we're very pleased to have such experts in the field who have had unique careers who have dealt and grappled with the ethics in the executive branch. We first have Bobby Birchfield, and we appreciate he's come a long way to be with us today. He is a partner at King & Spaulding in Washington, and he says that he does trials and appeals through the country, including a couple in the Supreme Court. But when I looked at his resume, he's outstanding lawyer of this, best lawyer of that. And he told me that he argued before Judge Scalia, whenever Judge Scalia was Judge Scalia in the DC Circuit in Judge Scalia's first case. So how interesting is that? He um, is 
he currently, the reason he's on this panel, apart from his outstanding legal prowess, is that he currently serves as the ethics advisor to the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust. And some of us might say, what in the world is that? He has served President George W. Bush on the Antitrust Modernization Commission and was the general counsel of President George H.W. Bush's reelection campaign. He clerked for the Third Circuit, received a JD from the George Washington Law School with honors where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review and, a B and received a BA from Wake Forest also with distinction in economics and politics. And he currently serves as the vice chair of the Wake Forest Board. Welcome, Bobby Birchfield. Our next panel member is Adam J. White. He is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and director of the Center for Study of the Administrative State at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. I like to say that, I'm gonna say that again. George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, where he, where he also teaches administrative law. He writes widely on the administrative state, the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and regulatory policy, and with special focus on energy and financial regulation. You can read his writing in all sorts of places, including the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, uh, the City Journal, the New Atlantis. He used to practice law at Boyd and Gray and Associates and Baker Botts, and he where he litigated regulatory and constitutional issues. But now he continues with his, his teaching and is appointed to the Administrative Conference of the United States, which is a federal advisory board on improving federal agencies' practices. And he also serves on the Federalist Society's executive committee uh, regarding administrative law practice. He holds a degree from the Harvard Law School and, the universe, and also a degree from the University of Iowa, and he clerked for Judge Sintel. Welcome, Adam. And last but certainly not least, in fact, is, is wonderful Toby Young. As you may well recall, in our first Texas chapter event, Toby was our host at the Bush Library. And we are so pleased to her that we were able to, to start off with such a bang at the Bush Library. And we appreciate to have her and her expertise on our panel today. Toby is the general counsel and board secretary for the George W. Bush Presidential Center. She is also the general counsel to the office of the former president for George W. Bush. And she serves as President Bush's designated Presidential Records Act representative to the government. Did you even know that those jobs exist? <laughs> That's fascinating. She has worked in all three branches of the U.S. government. Before moving to Texas, she was special assistant to the president and associate counsel in the office of the White House counsel. She worked as a trial attorney and counsel to the assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. She clerked for Judge Holmes on the Tenth Circuit, and she also had a stint as the press secretary for Representative J.C. Watts. We may now know that she is also the proud mom of 16-month-old Romilly Young. And she tells me that negotiations with Romilly are much more difficult than with the high-level heads of state that she's dealt with in the past. Welcome, Toby Young. We're going to hear brief statements from, from each of the panelists, and we will uh, mix up some questions in the meantime, and then we'll take questions at the end of the panel, just as, as you saw on the prior panel. Thank you. You're up, Bob. <laughs> let, me, let me just, let me pick up, first of all, with your work. You mentioned, you mentioned the right. Okay. 
case, um, and uh, the argument was scheduled. So I showed up for argument. My case was the first case on the docket day. So I'm sitting at council table waiting for the panel to come in. The panel comes in. The presiding judge says, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our newest judge on the D.C. Circuit, Judge Anthony Scalia. Mr. <coughs> Burst, please you may proceed. <laughs> so I'm the first I'm the first lawyer to have argued a case for Judge Anthony Scalia. I'm also the first lawyer to have lost a case in a meeting authored by Judge Anthony Scalia. <laughs> 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 uh, this morning, thank you for the invitation to, to the uh, Texas Federalist Society. Let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today, just as a broad overview, and I'll probably get through this fairly quickly so we can take uh, questions from the audience as well as from the audience. Now, first, what is the issue that we address uh, as, as do I address it as the ethics advisor of the Trump administration, the, Trump, the Donald, Donald J. Trump revocable trust? Second, what is the structure of the, of the process uh, that we use? And third, why is it structured this way? What is the issue? Last November, as you all know, the voting public elected the wealthiest person to hold the office of president since That will be better. <laughs> and, and in fact, the conflict of interest uh, provisions ex expressly exempt the president, members of Congress, and the judiciary from the financial conflict of interest provisions that were initially uh, invoked against uh, President Trump. No longer does anyone dispute that these ethics statutes and civil service regulations are inapplicable to the president. Now they have shifted their focus both uh, in public commentary and in uh, litigation to the emoluments clauses. Um, in this context, an emolument, I submit, is a benefit, quote, arising from, unquote, or derived from, unquote, the office. The Oxford English Dictionary defines emolument as, quote, profit or gain arising from station, office, or employment, reward, remuneration, salary. Other dictionaries have similar definitions. Uh, consistent with that well-settled def definition, the Supreme Court in the, in the Hoyt versus United, Sta United States case in 1850 uh, said the term emoluments embraces every species of compensation or pecuniary profit derived from a discharge of the duties of an office. It's also apparent if you look at the wording of these emoluments clauses, emolument is used three times in the U.S. Constitution, that it, it is always tied to the performance of the duties of the office. The foreign emoluments clause says, no person holding an, any office of tr profit or trust under the United States shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument office or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. So that is that is at least implicitly tied to the service of the, of the Office of Trust or Profit. The Compensation Clause, or Domestic Emoluments Clause, as it's sometimes called, I think is even more clear. It provides that the President shall at stated times receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument other referring back 
to the term compensation from the United States or any, or any of them. And then the incompatibility clause, uh, which is Article I, Section 6, Clause 2, says no senator or representative shall during the time for which he was elected be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States which shall have been created or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time. So on a textual reading, there is a, a strong argument to be made that consistent with the dictionary definitions and the definition in, in Hoyt that an emolument derives is, is a payment derived from the performance of the duties of the office. Renting of a hotel room by from one of the Trump businesses is not correlated to his performance of the office of the duties of president. This issue is being litigated on three fronts currently. Um, there is a, a case in, pending in the Southern District of New York. The Committee for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington crew uh, has filed a lawsuit there alleging that uh, that the, uh, the Trump Hotel in, in, in New York violates the Emoluments Clause to the disadvantage of crew, which is having to spend money to litigate the case. That's their theory for standing. <laughs> Uh, a couple of a couple of fairly, um, I think, well, I, without being too pejorative, uh, I've never heard of these bars or restaurants. Um, they allege that they're that business is being diverted from the from the Trump uh, Hotel, and therefore they are being disadvantaged under the emoluments clause. Um, so standing is an issue there. It's also being litigated in um, in the district court in D.C. Uh, by, uh, by Senator Blumenthal and about 235 other Democratic senators and, and congressmen who allege that their legislative prerogatives are being, are being compromised by the president's continued, use, continued uh, doing of business, uh, the president's businesses while he is in office. And the third lawsuit is a lawsuit by the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia, uh, and they allege that they, that they are being prejudiced that the businesses with under their jurisdictions as well as their state prerogatives are being prejudiced and Maryland argues that it would have never ever ratified the Constitution if it had thought the emoluments clause would allow this so <laughs> that that is that seems to me to be an all-purpose argument that states could make in any context um, looking at the historical context of the emoluments clause um, George Washington, while president, bought parcels of land, two parcels of land in D.C. from the United States government. That, uh, that uh, purchase was approved by three commissioners. One of those commissioners was at the Constitutional Convention. The two other commissioners were in the state conventions that ratified the Constitution no issue of the emoluments clause was raised during that purchase. Nelson Rockefeller, who was nominated to be vice president when President Nixon resigned and Vice President Ford became uh, vice president, um, had extensive holdings in the oil and gas industry in companies that do business worldwide, as well as domestically and with the federal government. Um, he was, he was, his confirmation hearings before, before the House and the Senate the constitutional provision allowing an appointment of a vice president uh, allow, uh, has confirmation by both the House and the Senate. His confirmation hearings went on for months, and the emoluments clause issue was not a major issue. And then more recently, former Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker retained considerable holdings in, you guessed it, Hyatt Hotels, uh, and was, there was no emoluments controversy about her continued holdings of those hotels. So th th it, is, it, it is, I would, I would submit, we'll see how the judges come out in the, in the uh, Southern District, the District of Columbia, and District of Maryland on this issue, but it, it, seems, um, it seems pretty hard to argue that in a historical context as well as the definitional context, there's an emoluments problem here. So what is the structure that, we, that has been set up for reviewing uh, business transactions with the, with the Trump businesses? Um, at his press conference on January 11th at Trump Tower, the president announced the structure, and uh, Allison Ho's partner, uh, Sherry Dillon, uh, uh, announced 
the structure. Her other partner, Fred Fielding, uh, former White House counsel, was involved in setting up the structure. I came in late and had a little bit of involvement in setting up the standards, but I was retained after this was set up. But I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, about, about 480 businesses, all the president's businesses, were transferred into the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust. The president resigned all of his positions with those businesses. The trustees of the trust are his son, Donald Jr., and Alan Weisselberg, who is the longtime chief financial officer of the Trump Organization. Eric Trump holds executive positions uh, with most of the companies now. He took the positions that his dad had had, uh, uh, and, uh, and Donald, I think, holds, holds a few of those positions. But the president is completely absent from the day-to-day -day contact of these businesses and has no, has no involvement in them. There are about 17 categories of transactions that the uh, businesses uh, can engage in, including, um, including branding and management transactions, that can only be undertaken with the written approval of an independent ethics advisor, and that is, that is the job that I hold. The standards that I use in, in reviewing those transactions are essentially fourfold. And, and bearing, bear in mind that there has never been a structure like this set up before. This is the first time in the history of the Republic that anything like this has happened. There are no standards, so we are, we are I am uh, playing this as I go, but informed by, uh, by decades and, and centuries, really, of, of conflicts of interest, uh, uh, law and uh, and law in other in other contexts. I'm I'm reasonably familiar with that law and and would and and am trying to walk a line here that is that is consistent with it. So the standards that I apply are number one: the transaction has to be in the regular course of business and at fair value. Number two: it has to be with an appropriate counterparty. In other words, this, the counterparty must, have, must be someone who is of repute and not trying to engage in, uh, in inappropriate activities through the transaction with the president. Uh, third, there's no indication that the, either the, the Trump organization or the counterparty is trying to take advantage of the president's position through the transaction. In other words, the Trump parties are not allowed to, to get to, to pursue rent additional compensation as a result of the president's position, nor are the, uh, are the counterparties allowed to try to make sweetheart deals to try to gain influence with the Trump administration. Um, and, and we look beyond just the value of the deal for any other indication that the, part, that the counterparty is trying to influence the administration. And then finally, in an all-encompassing criterion, we look at whether uh, there is any prospect that this transaction would embarrass or diminish the president or the presidency. I won't go into I won't go into any uh, any particular transactions, but would but would just say that this that that the role I play in this context is similar to the role that I played with other public officials and with corporate clients. Uh, during the course of my career, which is this is an iterative process. It is not a process where um, where the Trump Organization comes to me and they present a a deal to me and it's take it or leave it. If I see issues with a particular deal, I tell them what those issues are, and they often are able to go back and solve those issues in a way that will pass will pass ethics review. I won't sign a letter for them until I'm satisfied that they have passed ethics review. There have been a number of instances in which they have come to me and I've flagged problems for them, and I've never heard of the deal again. So I'm assuming that they did not resolve the issues. So this is not really, this is not necessarily a yes or no binary process. This is the sort of iterative process that all of you go with through your clients of, of you know, being a lawyer and helping them find the way to get to the right position in an ethical and legal way. Okay. So why, is, why do we have this structure in place? The president really, if you, if you accept uh, uh, Associate Attorney, Assistant Attorney General Scalia's position that the ethics laws don't apply, and if you read the emoluments clause, as I've suggested it should be read, why do this at all? Uh, the answer is it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a prudential structure that the president has set up. Uh, because it, it's it's the only I would submit logical way to deal with this issue and to try to and to try to minimize the prospects of conflicts of interest. Um, 
the ethics, I call them the ethics industry. There's a well-funded cadre in Washington uh, that is always out there alleging that primarily Republicans are in violation of the ethics rules. We have, we have a sense of where their funding is coming from, although, although dis notwithstanding their, their demands that, that their adversaries disclose where every penny comes from, they don't disclose where their money comes from. But we, have, we suspect we know. Um, they argued that, that, the, that the president should have simply liquidated everything before he became president. He should either liquidate his holdings or just not be president. Um, you can imagine what reception that had from the president. Um, and I'll say a few things about that. The first is that these holdings are extensive and diversified throughout the world. Uh, I don't know how much they're valued at. Um, I'm not privy to that information. But, but we know they're extensive. We know they're very diversified, from hotels to wineries to licensing deals to clothing deals. Um, and, and many of them are branding deals that use the Trump name. Uh, second, if you liquidated all these entities, you would have scores of counterparties, you, and probably counterparties from all over the world. So just as I go through on a transaction by transaction basis to, to evaluate the counterparties, scores of counterparties who would come in and bid for these businesses would have to be evaluated. Third. Lenders and investors in the counterparties would need to be evaluated. We look, we look not just at the first, uh, the LLC name, we look behind that to see who the real, where the real money is coming from and who the real parties and interests are. That would have to be done in all these situations as well. The terms of each transaction would need to be reviewed to see if it was at fair market value or if it was a sweetheart deal trying to, get, trying to curry influence with the president of the administration local, state, federal, and some foreign government approvals would be required. And, and for example, um, uh, Hart, Scott, Rodina, antitrust approvals would be required in some of these instances. Uh, some, of the license, some of the transfers of, of licenses would be subject to uh, real, local real estate and zoning laws. Um, there, would be, there would be government involvement in this process extensively. Sixth, it would take years to unwind. It would be a tremendous distraction and disruption to the president and to the entire administration as this was being undertaken. Um, and finally, uh, I have had the occasion in my legal career to litigate a number of cases that arose out of failed deals. If you're disposing of this amount of assets, it is inevitable, it would be inevitable that there would be litigation that would come out of it and you would, get, you would end up with, with that as a huge distraction. Uh, as well. Um, to give you an example of, of, of what I'm talking about, both in terms of the, of the, uh, of the government approval that might be needed and the, uh, the criticism the president gets, this is a letter dated July 7, 2017 from, uh, from Congressman Elijah Cummings and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. They're, rank, they're the ranking member and another, another minority member. And they are criticizing the president and asking some questions about the sale of, of Starrett City, uh, the Starrett City Complex, which is a, an apartment complex in New York City, um, and in which the president owns, at most, about a 4% interest. He's a passive investor in this deal. So, they, so, so the letter says, uh, in, the, in, in the second paragraph, the president has rejected the advice of ethics experts from across the political spectrum by refusing to divest his ownership in his personal businesses. Remember, he has a 4% stake in this, and he's got a lot of other businesses. Okay, that's the second paragraph. The third paragraph, the very next paragraph says, the president is on both sides of the negotiations. He oversees the government entity providing taxpayer funds, and he pockets money from that, he pockets some of that money himself. So you should divest it, but you can't divest it because that's a conflict of interest. Subsequent paragraphs, you just kind of wonder, you know, are these people really thinking these things through? Um, okay, the other, another possibility would be a blind trust, and the, and and the ethics uh, gurus say that um, say that every other president has used a blind trust for for his or her ass his assets. That isn't true. President Obama did not use a blind trust. He held his interest in a, in primarily in U.S. government bonds uh, under his own management. He did not put it in a blind trust. Now that that that's 
raises two issues. First of all, it's not in a blind trust, which the ethics guys say he should have been. And second, it's government bonds. He's receiving money from the federal government on, as interest on those bond payments, and that, under their theory, that any income from a federal entity violates the compensation clause would be a violation of the compensation clause. Um, and then finally, I would just say uh, Donald Trump is the, is the first person since George Washington of such immense wealth to, to have held the presidency, but he's not the first person of immense wealth to have held office in this country. Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, a billionaire, uh, had extensive holdings in a number of different businesses. He set, what he set up was not so dissimilar to what uh, Donald Trump has set up. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg was explicitly subject to Chapter 60A of the New York City Charter, uh, which imposes ethics obligations on, on New York City uh, officials. Um, but he elected, he did put his interest in a trust or under separate management, but he retained the interest to make major decisions on behalf of those businesses during the time he was the mayor. And that, that was maybe modestly controversial, but you won't see many articles at all uh, raising the prospect of, of Mayor Bloomberg um, um, being subject to con the conflict of interest rules. So this has been, as I said, this has been a very unique engagement. It's not the sort of thing that, frankly, I would have ever guessed I would do when I went to law school many years ago. Um, but it is, it's, it's, a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating engagement, and I am, I'm honored to have been chosen by the president to do this. So thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time to explain a little more to us about something that is a unique ethical, ethical issue. From ethics with the, with, the, with the trust to ethics in the agency. Well, as Judge Elrod mentioned at the outset, uh, I did have the great good fortune to begin my legal career um, after my clerkship with uh, Baker Botts, uh, granted one of the branch offices up north in Washington. But um, it, it's just very nice to be back in Houston and back among friends and former colleagues. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to come back. I only wish I had time to swing by NINFAs on navigation uh, before I got out of town. Um, but one of, the, one of the pleasures of coming and, and speaking to a Federal Society audience is that I can always feel comfortable starting with first principles. Um, so when the subject at hand is, ec uh, is ethics in the executive, I thought it would be good to begin by recognizing that the framers expected, or at least hoped, that the executive branch would exemplify high ethical standards. And as with so many things, this point was made best by Alexander Hamilton, specifically in Federalist 68, where, uh, where Hamilton predicted that the Electoral College would elevate men of high character. A single state might support a man with, in Hamilton's words, talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity. But to win the Electoral College would require, quote, other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him in the esteem and confidence of the whole union. Thus, Hamilton saw, foresaw, quote, a constant probability of seeing the presidency filled by characters of preemin characters preeminent for ability and virtue. And Hamilton had similarly high hopes for executive branch appointees, at least at the highest levels of each department. In Federal 76, he wrote that the Constitution's method for appointing officers, namely presidential appointment with Senate advice and consent, would, in his words, prevent the appointment of unfit characters from state prejudice, from family connection, from personal attachment, or from a view to popularity. And all this accorded with the views of Hamilton's co-author, James Madison, who wrote that Republican government needs virtuous men. Of course, the framers knew famously that men aren't angels, and thus they framed a constitutional system through which ambition would counteract ambition. Uh, as Madison acknowledged frankly, uh, as he, so eloquently as he often was, quote, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Still, Madison emphasized in the closing lines of Federalist 55, that as there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspec circumspection and distrust, so there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Republican government, he said, presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form of government. In other words, Republican government requires Republican virtue, especially in the executive branch tasked with enforcing the laws of the United States under the president's duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So fast forward to 2017, and we hear a lot of talk about executive branch ethics, primarily by the president's critics, who accuse him of falling short of the standards expected of his office. 
And to be sure, I've often found myself among his critics too, both during the presidential campaign and in his first year of an office. But my purpose here today is to focus on the importance of ethics inside of the executive branch, especially among lawyers. Quite simply, a well-functioning Republican government requires the highest ethical standards within the executive branch. And the rest of my time this morning, I want to focus on a few specific examples. I'll start with the president's opponents within the executive branch. Ordinarily, this might seem like a contradiction in terms. We don't usually expect the president to have opponents within his own executive branch. But from the very first moments of President Trump's presidency, we saw a startling new trend uh, of agency bureaucrats announcing themselves as a self-styled resistance movement. On January 31st, not even two weeks after the inauguration, the Washington Post published a report headlined, Resistance from Within, Federal Workers Push Back Against Trump. The article described efforts by bureaucrats in the Justice Department and other agencies to, quote, push back against the new president's initiatives. This was just one of many news reports in the opening months of his presidency describing efforts by executive branch of employees to block or hinder their own agency's programs. To the extent that agency lawyers are participating in these efforts to thwart the agency's programs, we should ask, are the lawyers violating their own ethical standards that govern their own conduct as lawyers? Rule 1.3 of the Federal Bar Association's Model Rules of Professional Conduct for Federal Lawyers requires that, quote, each federal lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. As the comment to this rule explains, a federal lawyer should act with commitment and dedication to the interests of the client and with morality in advocating the client's position. So to the extent that the anti-Trump resistance includes government lawyers, there's at least a risk that lawyers are abdicating this professional responsibility. And so we should ask, who is the government lawyer's client? The model rules are straightforward. The client is the agency itself acting at the direction of its duly appointed leadership. Model Rule 1.13 spells this out at length. Now, true, there's a longstanding academic debate over who a government lawyer's client is, and there are longstanding academic debates over everything. Uh, and some argue that the true client is, quote, the public, or the public interest, or the government as a whole, or other possibilities. But I think Professor Jeffrey Miller was right 20 years ago when he wrote that our Constitution's framework necessarily assumes and implies or requires that agency lawyers represent their agencies acting at the, at the direction of their lawful leadership, led, of course, by the president, the unitary executive. Having said all that, we should take care to recognize that some federal laws do supersede these obligations. All federal employees are required by 28 U.S.C. 525 to report criminal wrongdoing <coughs> by government officials. Furthermore, the Federal Whistleblower Protection Act strongly encourages federal employees to report criminal, criminal wrongdoing within government by protecting whistleblowers against reprisal. But to the extent that government lawyers' resistance activities do not trigger those limited and extraordinary exceptions, we need to start thinking seriously about whether they are violating their own ethical duties. Now, in my remaining time, let me take a step back and make a broader point. I began with Alexander Hamilton, so let me return to him to close. As he famously observed in Federal 70, our constitutional system requires energy in the executive, uh, which he said was a leading character in the definition of good government, crucial, of course, for national defense, but, as he also stressed, not less essential to the steady administration of the laws. Our Constitution depends on energy in the executive. So we need, but for the, energy, for the executive to be energetic, it must be supremely ethical. This is a point that Terry Eastland, a veteran of the Reagan Justice Department, made eloquently in his 1992 book, Energy and the Executive. He made two points. The first point is now familiar to us. We need an energetic executive, something that conservatives might not have appreciated before the 1980s, but I think by and large we do now. But the second point then was that because we need an energetic executive, we need that executive, his entire administration, to be ethical. Terry, uh, uh, Terry Eastland reflected upon the lessons of Iran-Contra and urged that presidents must demand the highest ethical standards from their administrations because clouds of suspicion about unethical behavior will inevitably drain a president's own administration of his energy. This argument reflected Hamilton's basic view of the presidency as set forth in the aforementioned Federalist 68 and 70. It also reflects, in my opinion, Hamilton's warning in Federalist 22 that allegations of corruption are all the more corrosive to Republican government, in which our leaders are expected to remain faithful to the common people and not faithful to factions aligned against the public interest. And frankly, this is something that worried me from the very first weeks of uh, President Trump's term in office. 
when I originally wrote on this subject an article uh, in City Journal magazine uh, titled Ethics and the Executive. I have no idea whether any of the allegations against President Trump or his subordinates are even plausible. Um, but by now, we can be confident that the executive branch's energy, President Trump's own energy, will be drained away by special, <coughs> by special counsel investigations, congressional oversight hearings, and press investigations if the administration itself does not promptly rebut and dispel allegations of misconduct by executive branch officials. Let me put it bluntly. If the administration approaches these issues like defense lawyers, litigating things very aggressively um, on, on very defensive terms, before long, maybe already, the administration will lose its own ability to carry out its own programs, programs that people voted them into office for, many programs that I agree with on a number of important federal issues. This administration will undermine its own ability to carry out any of that if it aggressively and hyper-defensively uh, takes stances uh, like uh, the president's point that the ethics laws don't, don't, don't govern the president. That's true as a matter of law. That's literally true. But as a prudential matter, as, as Bobby mentioned, it's extremely counterproductive to the ordinary workings of good government. I think approaches like that will, will undermine the administration's own capacity to govern energetically. So for the sake of his own presidency, President Trump needs to empower the White House Counsel's Office and Justice Department and all other parts of government to ensure that lawyers and all their officials in his administration are achieving the highest ethical standards. It's no exaggeration to say that our Republican Constitution depends on it. Thank you. Well, Toby, can you tell us what it's like to work for an energetic executive? <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, thank you, Judge Elrod, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. I want to just say that it's nice to be in Houston and see your city and all of you living here. You've been in our thoughts, and I know you're going through a lot, so we also appreciate you sitting here listening to us on a Saturday when you probably have a lot of things going on in your own life. Um, as, as she said before, I hold three legal roles within the, the Bush world as it is today. I'm the general counsel for the office of the former president, as well as the general counsel for the foundation that he's established for his library. And um, typically, and then the Presidential Records Act, where I'm his interface with the current government, as well as the Congress when they're looking for records from the Bush administration. And I can say on the former president, typically when I tell somebody that job, they look at me and I get one of two responses. It's either why does the president need a lawyer? Or they look at me suspiciously and say, how did you get that job? Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting job. The history of it is interesting. It wasn't always there. That It came about after President Truman left the office. And it became clear that presidents are still expected to be statesmen around the country. They still have duties. They still get letters from Boy Scouts and veterans. And they're responding. And President Truman didn't have the individual resources that other presidents had had and found himself working hard to respond. There wasn't a pension for presidents either. And so Andrew Carnegie offered to pay the government some money to allow for a pension for former presidents. And ethically, they looked at that and said, hmm, that might not be the wisest thing to do to have an individual funding this, and how would that affect presidents going forward? So Congress passed an act creating the office of the former president, allowing for pensions, a small staff, that helps them answer the public and do some duties that we still expect of our presidents. In that role, um, one of the things that you're not allowed to do is use the government money for political activity that a former president might engage in. My former president I work with has opted not to be very political in his post-presidency, but there are others. So you have the franking with the government mail and um, your computer resources. So we separate that out. And part of my job is to, to monitor that. I, um, the first, I'm the first general counsel in an office of the former presidency, and that is basically because there was still litigation pending when President Bush left office. There were still congressional investigations pending, and we needed someone to oversee that and represent his interests in, in how the current government monitored that and in the settlements. You'd be surprised how frequently also a former president is sued. And so I, I work with the current administration, whoever that might be, and the Department of Justice in getting him represented in official capacity. Um, we had someone sue us a couple years out of office for $50 million for the uh, ESP he had on uh, 
international national security and he wanted President Bush to pay up, he would send us a bill every month. So, you know, it's, there are little things that you still have to deal with and tie up with a bow, which is, is fun. But I think the, the more interesting aspect is, um, and I feel like Adam set me up perfectly walking into this, is the work we did in the office of the White House Counsel. Again, there's an interesting history to that. There was not always a White House counsel in the White House. This was something traditionally that was thought of the Attorney General would represent the legal advice to the President. Um, I learned in researching for this, something you may know but I didn't, that initially the Secretary of State had the U.S. Attorney's offices reporting to the Secretary of State. It was not always the behemoth of the Department of Justice that we now think of that really was there at cabinet meetings to advise the president. As the government you know, grew and the Department of Justice grew, they created the Office of Legal Counsel in, I believe it was in the 30s. And the Office of Legal Counsel really took on the role from the Attorney General in advising the president and the White House on legal matters. And they still continue that role, but I think under the growing you know, government responsibilities, President Roosevelt, as he was growing the government, decided he needed his own White House counsel to be there with him. The role was quite different than it's thought of today, and while it was a lawyer, he was actually mostly a speechwriter and helped you know, frame the policies that were, were coming up. The evolution of this has been interesting. During, it stayed one person until Nixon. During the Whitewater investigation, John Dean decided to get a staff of five which is pretty amusing now when we look at all the investigations and, and know the extent of Whitewater that they, they brought on five attorneys to work on that little investigation. And um, over time, it's grown. I can tell you in the Bush administration, they started with 10 attorneys. This counts the vice president's attorneys. By the end, there were 22 attorneys. The Obama administration started with over 40 attorneys. And I, by a, I'm not sure the exact count of the Trump administration, but I know they at least have 30 attorneys right now in there. And a lot of this, quite frankly, is for ethical reasons. I would submit some of it is politicizing ethics. The Obama administration said that 18 of their 40 lawyers were dedicated solely to ethics slash vetting appointment issues. And, you know, it's when people are looking for a needle in a haystack on every person you're appointing, whether it's in the executive or the judicial, you have to have people there ready with thimbles and to make sure the needles aren't there. So it, it takes up a, a vast amount of resources. Um, there are other things that the White House Counsel's Office does before we get into kind of the client issues that I want to make sure everyone's aware of. I think it's an office that can seem sort of opaque to the outside world, and I think besides the the major bulk of what we do, it depends on who the White House counsel is. It depends on who the president is and that relationship that they might have had before the president came into office. But we do know that you usually advise the constitutional prerogatives of the president. You look at legislative advice, signing statements, are there you know, legal problems with it, whether you should veto. You also look at advising the staff on ethical concerns. In the White House, everybody fills out a financial disclosure and you fill out um, you know, you have Hatch Act issues. The Office of the Presidency is interesting in that there are still political responsibilities you do. You're often thought of as the head of your political party, even though you're representing the government. So the lawyers advise a lot on how to separate who pays for what when the president's on a trip and he might do a fundraising dinner for his political party and the next day he's going to a school that maybe was devastated by a hurricane. Um, so you have lawyers in there always looking for that, dividing it up, advising in that issue. You also have, like we talked about, lawyers strictly devoted to the ethics issues following on the, you know, what you're allowed to do as well as financial disclosures. I will say from our administration we have uh, one person who was pretty much strictly doing some of the financial stuff but now on television holds himself out as an ethics czar and he was not the ethics czar in our administration, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, he, he's one of the only ones, I think, who's sort of made a living off of exaggerating what he did in the White House Counsel's <laughs> office. <laughs> um, so, so who is the client? You know, I'll take a step back in the office of the former president. To me, this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, you know, I, I look at, I represent the Bush administration's interests that might still be ongoing. 
a lot of the records from the Bush administration are still closed, and for good reason. You know, the president always says to me, why are our records closed? I don't have anything to hide. I don't have any emails. Open them up. And I tell them, well, the rest of us still have to get jobs, and we gave you candid advice. So let's not open everything up too quickly. I mean, there's, there's a reason <laughs> that it's there. And, and you want to protect your staff on that. You want people to give their best candid advice, not thinking of when is this going to be open and what's my next job? How do I, how do I get that there? So I represent that when Congress is asking. The current White House can ask for records from the Bush administration. Um, to do their current business. So a lot of times you'll hear, you know, we walk in with a blank slate and the Office of Legal Counsel is really the institutional memory. They still have the opinions and they're consistent and they, they seek back, you know, what did we do before? How does that advise what we're saying now? Well, there is a little bit of a tool for a history in that you can ask the former presidents for records of what they had. The Obama administration took a lot of advantage of this in ways that had never been done before. So. For instance, when they had to give an ethics briefing, they called me and said, we'd like the ethics briefings that the Bush White House gave internally to their staff. So they did not have to reinvent the wheel there. Um, and they, you know, I think they smartly used it. And I called the Trump White House when they started, and I said, you should think about this. You need to take advantage of the resources that are there. But it's also my job, if something's overbroad or if there's something not open yet, to be careful in accommodations and negotiation of how that's given over. and if any deliberative process that we still feel very protective over is turned over. In the White House counsel, I think people um, are probably confused. You're standing up, you're giving ethics advice to the employees, the president's asking you what he does on something, but who really is the client? My former boss, Fred Fielding, who Bobby knows well, made it very clear. The client is the office of the presidency, not the president. Sounds clear cut, sounds bright line, but is it really? It's hard when you have something, you know, the fast pace of the White House ongoing. I think about, you know, the first White House counsel who might have gone into President Bush and said, I'm your lawyer, sort of. You know, for somebody who's not a lawyer, that's a complicated thing to explain. And there's the one thing you want as an attorney is trust. You want your client to trust you. And I think, you know, it's a precarious situation these days. You're not exactly sure where the office of the presidency ends and where the personal issues begin. And, you know, there have been a lot of people concerned about this delineation. Is, is this going to lead to presidents going to outside counsel for everything? And inside White House counsel, they need to know what's happening to advise. So it's an interesting situation. Um, and, you know, it's, it's still being discussed. I think... Um, one of the things you look at is the balancing of interests, the balancing of powers in determining this. And we can look at history, but right now we can look at last week's New York Times to also discuss what's happening. So you have a White House counsel during the Reagan administration. The diaries are being sought from the Rand Goddard stuff. What do you do? Well, the political people want to turn over the diaries immediately. Let's rip the Band-Aid off. Let's get this off. Let's get it going. The White House counsel saying, wait a minute, there's precedent here. What are, what are we doing? What are we setting up for the future? Maybe you're not so worried about what's in there now, but what are we giving up for the executive in the future? And it's a delicate balance between all three areas. So when I was there, and I was there you know, towards the end when we ramped up for the investigations, and it's, it's sort of like junior high, the White House Council starts off as the nerds in the corner, but by the end, there's 22 of us. You're running the school now. They're all asking, <laughs> Mother, may I? What am I going to do now? Congress changes, and, and you're, you're being investigated. Um, so, you know, we looked. You have to look. I think the hard part and the point of Fred Fielding saying the office of the presidency is you have to look beyond the immediate needs of that crisis of that day. And you're thinking long term about the good of our government, about the public interest. You're, you're looking to say, I don't think that Congress should get this. I don't think the special counsel should necessarily be able to interview the deputy White House counsel about these issues. I think this was actually attorney-client privilege. But am I going to push things to the brink? Am I going to cause problems here that I, I don't know how to get out of? And so you've seen that. We had a lot of accommodation during ours where we would go and give an interview where there are no notes taking, so that they, you know, we're, we're trying to work with you, but we do not believe you have this power necessarily to subpoena us and ask for this. 
there was also, you know, you can push it to the brink. There's a lot of discussion from the Clinton White House. And when Bruce Lindsay, who I know very well in the post-presidential world these days and is a very good person, he, he claimed attorney-client privilege. They fought it to the brink. They went to the D.C. Circuit. They lost. So that's a, a bargaining chip that a lot of people now say, hmm, maybe you shouldn't have pushed that so much. Maybe that was the weaker case to push attorney-client privilege, and we should have backed off. So you're always thinking about the future, about the executive, and how that balances out. Um, and that can be discussed con continuing. And I think the example from today in the New York Times is there's, you know, where was the personal for President Trump? Where is the executive? He now has personal attorneys working on this. You have an attorney that's been sectioned off to only work on investigations so that it doesn't take over an entire White House counsel because, like we went over, you have a lot of work to do day to day to get your policy work done, and you're hoping that investigations don't take over your entire administration. So you have, you know, Don McGahn now has to ask, what, I'm being subpoenaed. What am I allowed to say? The pres if he doesn't have attorney-client privilege in this, there is executive privilege in it. Is the president claiming executive privilege on anything I know? What should I talk about? And so he's also, you know, some people are advocating, the personal attorneys, let's get this over with. Let's move it along. Turn it over. But Don McGahn's has to sit there and say, what's the best interest of the presidency as a whole, as the executive? Um, so there's interesting questions that obviously people much smarter than I have held the position of White House counsel and grapple with. And it's, it's an interesting question that I don't think we'll answer anytime, anytime soon. I think it will continue as ethics is politicized on, on both sides. Thank you, Toby, for that, that overview. And, and, and we, we have two or three other topics we could talk to you because you have such a vast, vast job and vast experience. And if we have time, we'll cover some other things in the questions. Uh, we're going to start taking questions just a minute if you have a question. But um, could I ask you a question? Is your client, therefore, we were talking about who the client is, is your client the trust itself? It is, but it's... but. As is true with any trust, there is a beneficiary of the trust. So the beneficiary. And the beneficiary is, is Donald J. Trump, who currently is president. And so I see my mandate as it's, it's really a dual mandate to allow uh, to, first of all, protect his, uh, protect him in the, in, in, from, uh, from conflicts and from embarrassment through business transactions that are undertaken by his businesses, but yet to uh, to allow the businesses to to proceed in the regular course of business uh, as as they as as is appropriate. The easiest thing for an ethics lawyer to say is no. You can never get into trouble if you don't let your client do anything. Um, but I've, I've been quoted by a by a longtime client is something that I supposedly said years ago. I'm not sure I said it, but. I like it. Uh, it, and it, it. I didn't go to law school, law school to learn how to say no. Uh, I mean, the purpose, the, 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 the object of a lawyer, particularly an ethics advisor, is not just to, just to find ethics issues and stop the train. The issue is to flag the ethics issues and then work with the client, if possible, to try to do what they want to do in an ethical way. Uh just to expand upon that, I agree 100%. You read a lot of interviews, and they say the most important thing a White House counsel can do sometimes is tell a president no. Well, maybe in certain circumstances, but the problem with saying no all the time, and especially in the ethics contest, is guess what happens? They don't consult their lawyers. Right. And you have a much bigger problem in the end than you would if you were in on the beginning, and, and you you're more caution and you're listening and you say, how can I help us get to the right answer where we're all comfortable? Um, you know, and in the White House, often you'll get, is this legal or prudential advice? Well, to me, that's a distinction without a difference. Be there in the beginning, don't be afraid to hear things and help people work it out. The, the no just gets you out of the room. And, and, we, and we have the same issue in the, in the private sector. My, my corporate clients, uh, we are, we are, you know, we represent the corporation. We don't represent the individual officers of the corporation. So that goes back to the point that Toby was making before, that you're often put in a position where the person that's actually hired you and paying you may not necessarily be the person that is, that is the ultimate client. Um, and, and, you know, there, is, there, there are 
more instances, I think, in corporate America where that raises an issue, frankly, than, than, than the bar often, often admits. Um, but it does arise in the private sector as well as in the, in the public sector. Do you anticipate this job carrying on once the president completes his term or terms of office? And if we don't know because this is a new thing, or is that a, is that maybe that's, maybe you don't want to talk about that. Uh, I, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. I do not envision myself continuing this role <laughs> beyond the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I, 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 I believe the president's intention is once he completes his time as president that he will go back and, uh, and, and resume his, his role as the head of these companies. And so at that point, there, there may, I guess it's conceivable there could be ethical issues that arise in that context, but I don't think that he will need this structure at that point. Well, I have a lot of questions I can ask, but this is your time to ask questions. So if you want to line up, if you have questions, and I can barely see you because I'm so short, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Mr. Bowen. Well, thank you. Um, I do a lot of international work, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that we're always conscious of with clients is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, there's no question under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that if a U.S. bank hired the uh, spouse of the Nigerian foreign minister or the spouse of the Russian foreign minister, uh, paid that spouse several hundred thousand dollars to come to the United States and give a speech to the bank for an hour, that that would be a per se violation uh, of the FCPA. Um, given that, uh, you know, if, if the, uh, particularly if we're talking, you know, in, in the case of ethics within agencies uh, or ethics involving former presidents, uh, just wondering if the uh, panel has anything they'd uh, like to comment about uh, you know, perhaps spouses of American uh, secretaries of state giving such speeches uh, for hundreds of thousands of dollars in other uh, locations. Thank Do you, you have anyone in particular in mind? <laughs> no, it's funny. Um, in 2015, I wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard, 2015, so a year before the election, called Beware of Russians Bearing Gifts, <laughs> and it included a photo of, of Secretary Clinton and Vladimir Putin shaking hands and laughing. Uh, so I was, I, was, I was interested in the emoluments clause before it was cool. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the point you, you've raised about how this is much more cut and dry in the private, you know, in, the, in, in the general you know, sector in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act just reflects what a challenging subject this is. On an issue like that, it's, Congress has every sort of power and right to draw crisp, clear lines and to err on the side of, of, of going above and beyond on ethics. I mean, with presidential and executive branch ethics, which is so much more fraught with separation of powers problems, it's one of those issues where, I, like I said, I think it's probably right that Congress can't directly regulate the president's ethics in that way and, and may not even be able to, to reach in and directly regulate uh, to the same extent as the FCPA, the, the ethics of the highest government officials and advisors to the president. Um, that's why it becomes such a challenging issue to be hashed out through the political process in the long run. Um, and it begins with the choices that, an, that an, an administration makes for itself at the outset of its administration and then sticks to um, going forward. Okay. We have another question. Hi. Um, it's part of the issues that could come up with, with President Trump post-presidency career um, or, you know, President Clinton's post-presidency career. It's the fact that presidents or former presidents are still entitled and often receive the same daily intelligence briefing that the current president receives. That's always seemed very odd to me that, you know, former presidents who have no legal authority whatsoever are entitled to vast intelligence. Um, you know, unequal to anyone in the U.S. government except the current president. And if you're engaging in these foreign deals, that would seem to create a conflict, and it would have seen like it would with President Clinton, and yet, or at least, you know, create issues that need to be addressed, and yet you never hear it um, even as an issue that anyone should think about. And, you know, should there be any qualification in terms of your business to maintain not just a security clearance, but daily briefings at the level of the current president? We've been very, um, I, I think my, my boss enjoys the briefings, so. <laughs> 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 
we're, we're in the process of, uh, we're, we're, I think we're the only office that actually has, the, you know, a classified room where we can receive them. But I, that's, uh, I can say that's being rethought and how the intelligence is, is being given out is, is being given consideration in agencies that I have, you know, not a lot of insight into. But I will say that we go to great lengths within our foundation to be very careful about those separations and feel like we're held to a higher standard in the business we do because he is the former president and has a nonprofit foundation in his name. So we've been pretty careful in the business he does and, and where we go. And from the question before, you know, we've had we have an international, you know, first ladies initiative that Mrs. Bush runs and we think very carefully about you know, typically you would pay a guest speaker to come in, and we're very cautious about when somebody comes in and what they can accept as a government official and what that might look like from from our perspective. So we, for us, legally, I've, I've asked us to go above and beyond the lines to be very careful. But, um, you know, it's, it's a good question. I don't have an answer as far as the, the perks of the former job. It is, it is part of what they get. All of them use it differently. Adam, you had mentioned that you know you believe that there are ethical issues ongoing by people within different agencies, and I'm I'm not going to express an opinion on that. Um, but are there watchdog groups uh, pursuing people? Uh, we've talked heard about watchdog groups pursuing other people today. Are there groups that actually want to go out and work on these ethics issues, or is there just really not an interest in? Um, well, I do want to say at the very outset, I'm be very crystal clear. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that I think that there are ethical violations happening in the administration, whether among the president's supporters or his critics. I want to be very clear. I'm just saying that, especially with respect to the resistance movement, I think we ought to ask questions and look into this because we now are seeing the circumstances that could give rise to unethical behavior by government lawyers. Um, thwarting their own agency's agenda. And if lawyers in the administration are doing that pursuant to the practice of law within the administration, they ought to be subject to the same, and they are subject to the same ethical standards that apply to any lawyer in the representation of his own clients. So I don't, I'm not prejudging anything. I was just, um, uh, just, just raising the issue. I mean, in terms of watchdog groups, as Bobby mentioned, there's crew, and crew obviously it's, it's, um, it, it's biases are, are well known, even if it's biased funders aren't as well known. Um, on the other side of things, uh, in the last administration, Cause of Action, I think, was a wonderful organization that really helped um, put sunlight, more sunshine, on the administration's workings. Um, they're still out there, and other groups are as well. But the challenge is to sustain that energy when your own pre when your own party has elected the president. Um, and I just I don't know where things stand right now. Thank you. And I'll ask another question. Uh, Toby, one of the things that you've been involved with has been in advising judicial nominees at, for the Supreme Court, at least as I understand it. Um, who is the client in that situation, and how does that work? Yes. So I, um, I had the um, extreme honor to spend a lot of time in D.C. earlier this year working with my friend, now Justice Neil Gorsuch, in his confirmation process. And it's a great question because, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, the administration, the executive is there to help the judicial nominees, but their client remains the office of the presidency. And the interests sometimes don't align 100 percent. I mean, they should because the president has just nominated somebody. You want to see them get through and you want to help them all that you can. But you have to bear in mind that the, the client is not the judicial nominee. And so... A few of us who have known the justice and worked with him went to Washington to make sure that he had lawyers who were thinking about his interests throughout it, and it you know wasn't a problem, and were able to work really well with people, and um, you know people in this room were very helpful in that process. But um, you don't think about it. I think the public sees it, and it, it looks completely aligned. But there can be legal issues that come up in dealing with his own financial disclosures, and that's not the White House's job to <coughs> go through that and make sure that's all, all perfectly done. I mean, they certainly want to support you, but, um, you know, it's, it's clearly the, the president remains, you know, the office of the presidency remains there. Do any of you have any questions? Hi, I'm Andrew McCartney. I'm a law clerk here in Houston. And this is a question for Mr. White. You mentioned 
potential concerns with hyper defensiveness mm -hmm. in um, ethical allegations. What do you think is the proper balance for an administration to have between, you know, resolving, dealing, answering with um, clarity, ethical questions and allegations that arise, but not losing the energy that you spoke about as being important? Yeah, that's a fair question. I mean, it's the it's the it's the hard question, the one I went out of my way to avoid in my prepared <laughs> remarks so far, because I don't, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and speak in very I want to be I mean, candidly, it's very easy for me to sit here and speak in platitudes that administration needs to be ethical and the rubber meets the road. And the question is, what does it mean in practice? Um, we can all sit here and go through the laundry list of missteps that the administration made in its opening weeks, right? The firing of CIA Director Comey, uh, which gave immediate rise to the, the context in which there would be appointed a special counsel and an office of special counsel lawyers with single-minded focus on, on, on finding crimes and maybe going overboard in, in, in their investigation, which is inherent in any in independent counsel investigation. You know, there's things like the, what I think, I, I might be wrong, but I think has been the administration's standoffish attitude towards congressional oversight. From the very outset, um, announcements that the administration was going to be extremely reluctant to put people uh, before Congress to answer questions candidly. I think that sort of all or nothing approach from the very outset is difficult. I understand that institutionally, White House lawyers especially, we need to be careful to protect the, the power of the presidency, including executive privilege. I understand that. But I also understand that when you waive a privilege, you aren't nullifying the privilege forever, right? That's the whole definition of waiving a privilege, is that you're waiving it in that context while reserving it elsewhere. And so again, it's easy for me to sit here uh, in, this, in this ballroom and, and, and say this, but I, I hope that the administration and my friends in the administration um, have opportunities to look at this not as all or nothing, not as asserting every privilege as aggressively as possible versus giving away the privilege now and forever in one fell swoop and find opportunities to selectively waive privileges where it's possible that doing so will help quickly dispel some of the more controversial uh, clouds of suspicion around this administration. Clouds of suspicion that might well be and probably are totally unfounded. Again, I want to repeat this. It's not that I believe these allegations against the administration. Quite frankly, I disbelieve most of them, probably all of them. It's not that I think that the special counsel is terrific. If anything, I'm tired of hearing how everybody thinks that this is on camera, but the special counsel and his office are all a bunch of saints who don't leak to the press, who don't do any of that. I think that's all completely uh, I think it's completely unrealistic. And so I'm not sitting here as a full-throated, relentless critic of the administration, wanting the administration to cede everything. As, as somebody who wants the administration to succeed, I hope they'll find opportunities to selectively waive privileges, where doing so will help uh, protect the administration's own energy to carry out the, the tasks of government. And just to weigh in from a different angle on the White House counsel's perspective, one of the ways that you can really help yourself in ethics and political charges is to go to the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice and ask them to weigh in on things and get the institutional knowledge. And if you're in court talking about a privilege or you know other, other areas of executive prerogative, if you've asked the OLC to weigh in, it does lend some credibility, uh, it helps with your ethics issues, it helps with the political issues a little bit too. And so I, I found that to be something that was um, very helpful to me in my job. And I think as the White House Counsel's Office grows, there could be a temptation to maybe move away from seeking OLC advice. And I hope that doesn't happen. I also hope OLC stays one of the agencies that doesn't seem overly political because if you're in private practice or anywhere else, your personal opinion doesn't matter that much. Your job is to represent your client. And that seems to be something, as Adam said earlier, that needs to be reiterated to every agency. You know, if you, if you have a personal opinion, go start your own organization and, and do something. But you're, you're representing the government's interests. You're not representing your own. Yeah. Well, we just have a couple of minutes. Do the panelists have any final thoughts? Well, just to reiterate what I said in the last thing, it's so easy for me to sit here and speak in platitudes, and I don't want to pretend otherwise. Um, but I do think that these are challenging questions that go to the very heart of Republican self-governance. And uh, those of us who believe in the, in the, the principles set forth in, in the Constitution and elaborated by Hamilton and Madison in the Federalist Society, or the Federalist Papers, um, <laughs> and in the Federalist Society, um, I, ho I hope that we'll all uh, continue to take these things very seriously um, from going forward.
I would just encourage people to, to take a stint during your legal career and try to get involved in government, whether it's in state government or in federal government. We need people in government who want to grapple with these difficult issues and want to think about, you know, the good of our country long term to help a president that you believe in. I mean, that's one of the interesting things in the White House Council is you're probably there because you knew the president, and yet your job is even larger than the president holding that office at that time. It's to think about the good of our country and, and how our government can work better. So I would encourage you all to, to go for it and take a stint in government. It's a very, very rewarding and exciting path to take as a lawyer. I would, I don't have anything as, as a student as that to say, but I would just say that um, I, I, I have found it uh, beneficial to, to have a continuing on background, off the record dialogue with many in the media about what I'm doing. I have found that, uh, and, and, and I, early in, in my tenure as ethics advisor, I was asked by the New York Times and the Washington Post to, uh, to brief them on what I was doing and answer questions. And I spent two hours with reporters from both. New York Times sent down three reporters, the Washington Post sent down two. And I talked to them and told them in large measure what I've told you today about why this is structured the way it is and, and, and the way it operates. And frankly, the, these are not friends of the administration, but their coverage in this particular area has generally been fairly, um, uh, fairly reasonably fair, I would say, since then. They haven't been fair on other issues, but on these issues they have been reasonably fair. Uh, I talk to reporters a lot on background and, and try, to, try to discourage them from printing things that are, that are not true. Um, and I, uh, and I, I sometimes succeed. Um, so I, I'm inclined to think that that uh, that there is a there is a, an opportunity uh, for this administration to be uh, not. The, the, the media will always be an adversary of this administration, but I think there 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 is a there there is an opportunity for the media, for the media in this administration to speak more, and to try to get their facts straight before they go to print. And, I, and I, I suspect that there are some there are issues on on both sides there that they that this, this administration could probably be a little bit more collaborative with the media and the media could be a little bit more collaborative with the administration for the benefit of, of the public the media's the media's incessant uh, criticism of anything to do with with Donald Trump has lost them I think significant credibility among the American public and that's too bad for the country because this country needs a strong media okay with that, Thank you to our panelists for a fascinating discussion.